I'm about to feed them to the sharks right now. Get them hype right now. Yeah. You know the ground is up. Yeah. Everybody that trains, you know the game. Yeah. So let's get it. Uh. Slap it up, bump it, and roll. Hey. Yeah, that's the way that it go. Ain't no better way to better yourself in this game. You're feeling the growth. That's, real. that's time on the map. We put in the work. Believe it ain't easy, I know. You know. But we train for the love of the game, the love of the art. Now slap it up, bump it, let's roll. Let's roll. Welcome to this episode of the BJJ Campaign Podcast. My name's Jeff Boone. I'm an A3, purple belt, four stripes. Phil Coors, A2, purple belt, four stripes. How you guys doing? I'm Jeff Glover. I wear an A1-sized gi, and I have been a black belt for 19 years. So that makes me a fourth-degree black belt. There you A1. We've got a guy who's an A1. His nickname is uh, Steak Sauce. Is that a little guy joke? No, it's no. not. It's, that's his name. That's his name. We call him Steak Sauce. It's an interesting name. <laughs> hey, worse, <one>. right? <laughs> well, Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Just sharing a few highlights of, of uh, the competition career, and that is with 34 wins. Guess how many of those came by submission, Jeff? Where does it say 34 wins? The BJJ heroes. Yeah, they're way off. They're way off. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, probably. It's more like 134 wins. There you go. Set almost 70% by, by submission, by the way. Yeah. One flying triangle in ADCC 2007. Yeah, I'm sure if they counted, like, if they were able to actually get all of my matches, my professional matches, I'm, I'm positive it would be more than 70% submission rate. Yeah. Yeah. Most notable, 2007 uh, Nogi World Champ. Also EBI runner-up in 2014. And then Pan Am Champ at Brown Belt in 2005-2006. Welcome to the podcast. Appreciate you coming. Uh, we usually do a Gordon Ryan update to uh, start the show, so we're going to stay with that. And so what happened this past week with Gordon Ryan, Phil? Training with John Jones again. Train with John Jones. That's one thing. Um, they were warning John Jones not to get sweated on by Gordon Ryan because he might test positive for steroids. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> I don't think they can do that. The other thing, Patrick Gaudio, he submitted him by arm bar. And oh, then about that. lo and behold, he's got a BJJ Fanatics <laughs> arm bar. Now that's marketing, Jeff, right? That's marketing whenever you submit the guy by arm bar and then you come out with your BJJ Fanatics arm bar tutorial. Very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on from that, um, we're lucky enough to have Jeff here for the week. He's been training me and a small group of folks in my uh, training facility out in the garage, the high tech training facility, <laughs> and uh, really enjoyed it. Tell me a little bit, Jeff, about um, about your career and how you got started in jujitsu. Uh, pretty typical. <clears throat> Started young in the teen years. By the time I got to my early 20s, I was, you know, like professional grappler, black belt level. And, uh, you know, pretty like, like I said, it's pretty standard. Got addicted to it. Wanted to do it every day, all day. Stopped doing a lot of other things. Started getting into athleticism for the first time in my life. And, um, yeah, my coach, my jiu-jitsu teacher, Frangia, who I still talk to to this day, he uh, moved into my neighborhood in Santa Barbara, came from Brazil, brought his pregnant wife and her whole family and three of their brothers and as many Brazilians as they could squeeze into that little house on the west side of Santa Barbara, California. And, you know, I made my way over there, made friends with neighbors. It was kind of a nice neighborhood like that. All the neighbors kind of knew each other, so we all got to meet them. And uh, next thing I know, I was wrestling with this dude in his front yard. He laid out a tarp and we were wrestling and he's teaching me moves and this and that. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Why is this Russian guy teaching me shit? He's not Russian. He's Brazilian. <laughs> what? Where's Russia and Brazil? That's how naive I was. I didn't even know what any of that meant. I was like, what? what? There's a difference. Other countries. I had never even like left anywhere except, you know, my mom's house. And like, that's that's it. I didn't, I was so naive to the world. So jujitsu introduced me to geography. 
<laughs> it introduced me to new cultures, um, you know, like five to six days into taking classes with this guy, with Frangia. I was committed for the rest of my life. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Um, was he responsible for kind of showing you, you've got a really unique approach to jujitsu in that, uh, and I'll butcher this, but you, you feel like it's very important to do the solo drills, like the ball drills, that sort of thing, the the shadow wrestling, uh, that sort of stuff. Did, did Frangia, did he introduce you to that concept or was that something that you kind of came up with on your own? Yeah, he, he does all that stuff, of course, you know. I just took his things and he was, he wasn't a very like, um, he wasn't very demanding of us that we, we exactly copied what he did. He gave, he gave a lot of his students room to develop their own game and would encourage you to learn to, to, he would tell you like, yo, you're doing something. You don't realize that you're doing something. I'm going to tell you what it is. You're doing this thing called, it's called an arm bar. You keep going for it keep going for that learn that practice that as much as you can research and study that because that's your shit you know that's what he told me with the triangle when i first started he was like kid you're little you're always going to be on the bottom at first you're not going to know how to sweep people yet you need to learn how to find triangles your legs are flexible as fuck you're skinny you're scrawny it's going to be good for you and i was like okay that's what i'm going to do because he doesn't do triangles Mm, right and incidentally most of your finishes according to bjj heroes are by triangle most of your submission finishes yeah yeah it works really well for my body type and he he recognized that and is very encouraging of people you know having their own style and he doesn't want to have these like cookie cutter you know like always have to like give praise to him because your style is him he wants you to be your own individual in jujitsu and kind of like praise yourself a little bit and uh i think that that the combination of having that type of mentorship with the structure, first of all, the mentorship plus the freedom to kind of do my own thing as well. And if I want to come back to, to having, you know, the guidance, he's like, I'm right here for you, but go off and do your own thing too. And I'll go off and do my own thing. Ah, oh, the world's scary. I'm going to come back to my coach. And he's like, I got you boy. Don't worry about it. Oh, go ahead. Go back out. I love you. Go do your thing, you know? And, uh, that along with, um, I'm just a ornery little wiry little, um, always got a chip on my shoulder, always got something to prove, you know, kind of an annoying person. And the combo of those created some dude who just does not stop until his opponent taps out. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, and, uh. Yeah, somehow, somehow in there, I developed some type of showman style. That 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 definitely wasn't something Frangia did. He wasn't trying to like put on a show out there. He was going out to win matches, and I was going out to win matches and like get everybody to look at me. Mm -hmm. Kind of like an attention-seeking type thing with yeah. tournaments, you know. Well, it works, and and it works for, you know what? It's it, one of the things that that I think is in the early days popularized i mean hell i wasn't even doing jujitsu whenever i saw one of your matches the first time and i was like oh this is really interesting right even people who don't do jujitsu find your style interesting to watch yes and exactly. that's not you know not a lot of people have that style today um and i feel like that's a real benefit uh to have that style Let's talk about, let's shift things a little bit and talk about um, what you did with money on the mat. And, and just for everybody out there online, uh, it is Jeff Glover online. And uh, you have the documentary that Roy Dean shot, Money on the Mat, kind of talking about this. So it, go out there, go to Jeff Glover online if you want to if you want to get it and uh, take a look at that documentary. Anything Roy Dean does is always really good from a, a, a cinematography and, and director kind of point of view. So let's talk about what what kind of got you into that uh, doing that. Yeah, uh, Roy has always been so cool to me. You know, um, he's always gone out of his way to like send me messages when I do something cool. And I don't even, I never even knew him. I was just, who's this dude who's like, hey man, my name's Roy. I think you're awesome. 
good for you keep doing what you're doing really inspired oh that was cool just always always the nice things um but but i didn't train with him i didn't know him coming up in the game you know i didn't know what team he was from i heard other people talking about him but we never really interacted and then one time i forget what it was i was like raising money because i had like an event coming up and i was like if anybody wants to donate to this thing and within like 15 seconds i remember it was like ding Roy Dean sent me like 500 bucks. Nice. <laughs> I was like, dude, who is this guy? <laughs> like, He's just so cool. And anything like jujitsu, he's like, yo, I'm going to support it. And any project I always had, he was like, yo, can I donate? And um, so he caught wind that I was doing these tournaments in Ventura, California with the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club at their clubhouse. They were kind enough to let us, they would clear their clubhouse out for us so we could put the mats in there. And, um, you know, I obviously paid them a percentage and it was a good working relationship. We did 11 tournaments and on the 10th one, Roy came and recorded it and he actually stayed with me at my house. No, I mean, he rented a place right next to my house in Goleta, Santa Barbara, California, and recorded me in the preparation to the tournament so for five days before the tournament he was recording my daily activities you know the dealing with people pulling out and jumping in you know like getting securing the mats securing this and that it's just all the all the things you go through in in the week before a tournament being the promoter of the tournament and uh it's it's pretty cool You, you you get a good insight into a lot more than that too he also recorded me just interacting with my friends and kind of the lifestyle that i live and the exercises that i do and uh, the things I do for fun, you know, there's a whole thing. Like I got really into like mini bikes. Like, yeah, I saw that. Like yeah. Coleman mini yeah. bikes. Like they're so fun, you know. It was like I can't just like do jujitsu. Like I do jujitsu, and then after jujitsu, p- students would be like, "Let's talk about jujitsu again." And I'd be like, "No, dog, I'm gonna go ride a motherfucking motorcycle." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'd be like, "Leave me alone. I need my mini bike time." <laughs> and he recorded all that, and um, it just and then and then he records the actual tournament, of course, and all these matches that went down, and any drama that went down, and. Um, and, and, and a big part of the documentary is also the relationship with my coach because why? Because Ventura, where the Hells Angels clubhouse is, is right next to Paragon, my coach's school. Mm. So I would take my van to Frangia's school, Paragon. He would let me put the mats, take his mats from his school, load them into my van, drive them to the clubhouse, unload them in the clubhouse, lay them out, have the tournament. Bow, tournament's over, roll them back up, put them in my van, drive them back to his school, unroll him at his school wow you know and and he never charged me a dime for it didn't ask for anything he was just like have my mats clean when you get them back boy you know what i'm saying put them back don't make me do that shit and we're cool mm. and of course i messed that up made him do it one time i just dropped it all. i was like my back hurts i can't do it tell your white belts to do it for me and he was like fuck boy i hate you i ain't doing shit and uh yeah so yeah thanks for asking about that it was it was a really cool um exciting time of my life share with us you shared with us uh, a a a day or so ago the first the uh first money on the mat where you had a little trouble with the law yes so when when covid hit the uh the jujitsu school i was at 30 members canceled their memberships which is all 30 of them they all got scared of covid little california babies (laughs) i'm scared i don't want to go into jujitsu now (laughs) so they all canceled their memberships and uh were they all blue belts just (laughs) um i mean yeah essentially yeah right yeah it was a young school and um so we had this lease still on the building but it was an empty building you know and these mats and this jujitsu school with no fucking students so I don't know, dude, the idea popped in my mind. I think I was scrolling through the internet and seeing all these like challenge matches that were going on in jujitsu at the time. I think we're talking about 2019. This started. Mm, yeah. 2019. Sure. So there was still all the like, yo, I got 10 K on it. You got 10 K. I got 10 K. I'll tap you out. I'll tap you out. No time limit. No time limit. You put your money up. up on it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And these guys were all, this was kind of a trend that was going on in jujitsu for a while. And it's not happening anymore. I don't know if you noticed. No, I did. Yeah. Dude, for sure. Dudes have stopped doing that because fools lost $10,000. 
dollars on a jujitsu match and have to fucking cry about that the rest of their life. <laughs> it sucks to lose a jujitsu match and lose ten thousand dollars, dog. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that shit hurts. You should get paid for that. That right. shit hurts. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. you didn't get a dime and you lost ten k. Why did you do that? Why did you th- like? Why would you do that? You know, you didn't think you were the possibility of losing was going to happen and you were going to be like bitter about this the rest of your life. Because I'll tell you what, losses are traumatic, bro. Sure. Professional yeah. losses are traumatic to us and good. They should be. We need trauma to keep us on our toes. You need trauma to understand how bad things can go sometimes. Even have to be professional. Yeah, even just losing a role. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The shit's tra- but imagine imagine like losing a match and there's like two thousand people like high fiving each other because you lost. And they're like, Yeah, fuck Jeff. Jeff sucks. <laughs> Woo And you gotta be like, Yeah, that's the that's how it goes, man. That's the that's the that's how the game is played, you know? Yeah. And uh because I've, I've had that happen before. I've lost a match. I'm all bummed. My arm fucking hurts because it got bent all wrong way and shit. I'm like, oh, my arm hurts. And I look over and dudes are like chest bumping. Yeah, Jeff sucks. <laughs> like, it's all good. It's all good. I'll find those fools in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend Sergio sit on those mofos. <laughs> um, yeah, but what was I talking about? The sheriff. Yeah, the, the, the school. And... Uh, Yes, yeah, so the challenge matches was going on and I put it up. I was like, well, all you guys that are down to put up money to fight, let's get 16 dudes, 300 bucks each. We'll put it into a pool. First place will get the majority. Second place will get a little something, something. And the house will get a little something, something. The house is me, obviously. Yeah. And, and the Hell's Angels. <laughs> well, well, they didn't come until after. I didn't even right. know who they were. I wasn't even friends with these guys. Right. You know, um, one of my black belts, his name is Morgan Mines or one of my, uh, my buddy black belts. He's a fellow Paragon guy. It's like six foot seven, 250 something pounds, big giant man. I call him the tree and he rides Harleys. And, um, you know, one day he just came and he was like, I had just come back from a seminar tour and I had like $8,000 cash on me. And he was like, what are you going to do with that shit, man? Let's go to the fucking Harley Davidson store. And I went and bought a Harley Davidson with him. And I was like, you know what? You're right. Went and put down 4k, you know, and drove, rode out of there on a brand new Harley. And he was like, dude, do shit with your money, man. Buy nice things. You deserve these things, you know? You deserve to have a fucking ride with me on the motorcycle across California. Let's do that shit. And I've done that with him. Anyway, he was my introduction to these guys. He called me up and he was like, hey, dog, uh, remember that problem you had with the sheriff at your place? And I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that tournament in again, ever again, because the sheriff showed up and called me and threatened me and was like, yo, I can arrest you for violating COVID laws, for having people in your building. This is when you were only allowed to have like three people in a building at a time. They had some absurd policies. California. Exactly. That's where I was born and raised, big dog. And, uh, and amazing I'm a conservative now. To, to make it through all that and, and, and become a conservative, I think is, is yeah, pretty agreed. amazing on my part. And, shoved a lot of people that way, right? What's that? Those policies shoved a lot of people towards the conservatism. <laughs> Not enough. Yeah. Not enough. I, I have friends from my childhood, man, from when I grew up in East L.A. that are little commies, bro. Just straight up communists. They're like, fuck America. Want this place give this land back to mexico I'm like, what are you talking about dog anyway so bada ba get a call from the sheriff the sheriff just happened to be an old buddy of mine that i used to train with so he was a little bit lenient on me he was like hey i'm supposed to shut you down right now big dog you know what i'm saying but i know you're doing a good thing you're doing jujitsu you're trying to make money i get it i'm gonna leave you alone do this tournament don't ever do this shit here again big dog He's like, don't ever try to run anything in Goleta. Anything that happens in Goleta, I find out about. I was like, fair enough, man. Just let me run this one tournament. Bah, we did the one tournament. Didn't do it again. Morgan calls me. Hey, I heard your tournament was a big success. I got a place you can do it in Ventura. Bah, rode the Harley down there. Met them. Talk yeah, numbers. They ain't fucking with the Hell's Angels. The cops ain't fucking with the Hell's Angels. It was all underground. Yeah. You know, we I didn't sign one liability release. There was no insurance. Not one of the competitors. And I had several hundred competitors. Not one liability release form signed. Nothing like that. It was all underground. Handshake, man to man. If you get hurt, tough shit. Don't fucking sue me. Mm. Be a man about it. You came in here and fucking wanted to have a match. If you get hurt, it's your fucking fault. Mm-hmm. Don't fucking sue me. You know, and nobody, and nobody got hurt. We did 11 tournaments. Nobody got hurt. It's um, impressive. Yeah. And isn't it? Right. It really like, is. Not seriously hurt. Like one kid, one kid hit his head on the wall because it was like <laughs> concrete walls. <laughs> one kid hit his head on the wall and that kind of fucked him up. But it, again, he wasn't he, that bright anyway. Yeah. So. He wasn't smart enough to sue me. Um, so yeah, that was fun. 
Yeah, that's, that's super cool. And and man, you know, so many people, so many jujitsu academies struggled during that. You know, all that lockdown and stuff, unnecessary lockdown, if you ask me. But, um, but yeah, it's it's a really unique approach to kind of keep it going, and and people need that, man. Mental health, yeah. physical health, all that stuff. Well, all the tournaments were shut down. I was the only tournament going at the in the country. Yeah. At the time, it was just me. Yeah. Naga was shut down. IBJJF was shut down. Um, ADCC, everything. Every organization that was running tournaments were like, oh, we're scared. And I was like, fuck you. I'm American, big dog. I had a, I had two grandfathers that were that fought for this country in World War II, homie. I'm not fucking bowing down to these commies and putting on masks and not running my businesses. I'm doing shit. I'm running a fucking tournament, you know? That was my mentality at the time. Yeah. You know, I was like, my grandpa, rest in peace, would not like me fucking not running my business during this. He would be like, God damn it, Jeffrey Dean, you run your goddamn business. You don't listen to these commies running this fucking country. America. <laughs> He's right, by the way. <laughs> That's how He's he was, right. man. William Glover. Yeah. God rest his soul. Yeah. He is absolutely right. Yeah. And kind, you know, kind of uh, not jujitsu wise, but I really, uh, I really, my, my opinion of Dana White came up in, during that period of time where he just said, you know, fuck this. We're going to find a way oh, yeah. to, to, to put the show on, you know, and they moved to Abu Dhabi on this fight island and, you know, stuff like that to, yeah. to keep it going, man. Cause look, there's a whole, there's a whole business ecosystem around not only jujitsu, but restaurants, bars, things of that nature that, that, that really, um, suffered during that period. Absolutely. So, uh, so Jeff, what would be, uh, what would be one of the two things, either the best advice you've ever received from someone or the best advice that you've ever given that you saw really took hold with someone and, and they really excelled after you gave them that, that advice. A buddy of mine from Santa Barbara, Harvey Miller, crazy degenerate, but he told me when I was super young to, not always think about what to do but in grappling but think about what not to do and i don't know for some reason that struck me i had never heard that i was like a blue belt obviously i know the idea of defense but the idea of what not to do really struck a chord with me you know it's like that can help you on the dance floor bro don't teach dudes how to do moves teach dudes what they shouldn't do and on the then, dance floor yeah. that's hilarious on the dance floor like you know don't do yeah. like don't do this and don't do that because you look feminine big dog you know what i'm saying like don't don't do this shit you know what i'm saying like telling dudes what not to do when you know what not to do then you're kind of just left with the right things to do yeah so then i don't even have to tell you the right things to do because you're gonna do it because you know don't do the dumb things i taught you all the dumb things not to do so that one struck a chord with me, and I think it helped me out a lot. Developing, that that really speaks to developing defensive responsibility, right? For sure. And that's what you're doing. Mm-hmm. It's a way better way to say it, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, that's super important, and especially at that blue, I feel like, especially at that blue belt level, too, is developing that, that the mindset of defensive responsibility. Yeah. Um, so you asked, what was the other part advice that I gave that, somebody that, that you, that you gave somebody that, that you really saw, you know, uh, take hold and re- you really planted a seed with them and that seed really sprouted, you know, uh, y- y- to where they were thinking in a, in a different way, you know, maybe, maybe it's as easy as it's as easy as, uh, you know, a marketing mindset from your own jujitsu or, or something of that nature. I mean, I think, I think my jujitsu kind of just speaks for itself. I think my record speaks for itself. You know, I think, um, people are in, inspired and motivated by me. Not even like, you don't have to listen to me talk or, or give you some sentence. Just watch how I grapple, mm-hmm. watch how I grappled, watch how I competed. And, and, I'm, you know, I get messages every day. You know, not to toot my horn, but I get messages every day from people who are like, bro, I'm so inspired by you. Like, bro, the last 14 years, you've been my motivation. And I'm like, what? I've been baked this whole time. I didn't, I wasn't trying to motivate you. You know, I'm just doing what I fucking love and find fun. And I find dynamic submission based transitional movie flowy jujitsu to be fun. And other people are like, well, that inspires me. And I'm like, hey, if I inspire you, God bless you. I'm happy to do that. I'm not trying to, though. I'm just having a good time. 
I'm happy to hear that that inspires you. And if I can kind of like stoke that fire a little bit, cool, I will. But don't don't get it mistaken and thinking that I'm out here trying to like inspire people. It just so happens to. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about uh, a little bit because I, I really enjoyed your your thoughts and your take on how boxing and the five steps of boxing relates to jujitsu and how you learn. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, like the uh, an, a friend told me this, but he was saying how the boxing coaches and TJ, the Mexican boxing coaches, they're very selective. TJ is Tijuana, but yeah, for yeah, everyone or Mexico, just Mexican yeah. boxing style, and maybe even maybe this even extends into boxing coaches worldwide. I wouldn't know, um, but what I heard from this guy struck me, and I was like, "Whoa, we need to use we need to translate that into jujitsu terms too." Um, but the idea is that a boxing coach. One of those old boxing master coaches will not just hold pads for anybody, bro. They want to watch you shadow box and hit the bag first for months, for months, and make sure that you're doing it the way they want you to do it before they'll be like, okay, now I'll hold pads and let you possibly fuck up and punch me in the face. I'm like a 70-year-old fucking little Mexican dude. If you hit me, you're going to kill me. You know what I'm saying? So um, they, they, they had their stages. Stage one was shadow boxing. Stage two was hitting an object that's not hitting back, a.k.a. bag work, um, or playing with a toy or playing with an inanimate object. Um, number three is they'll hold pads for you. You get to actually interact with the human. There's fighting the air, fighting a bag, fighting a person or working with the person. Pads, instructions first, lessons first. Then after that, after step three, we get to step four. What's step four? Fighting, sparring an actual person. And then after sparring an actual person, then you get to five where you take a fight because sparring is dudes in your gym. Taking a fight is somebody you don't know, right? So those are the five steps. And it's, it's crazy how many people jump right to step five, huh? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They, and and they, 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 they may even do step two or step four. They might do step three. They might do step four. But it's amazing how many people skip that step one of shadow boxing. Now, no, no good boxer in the world skips that shit. But in jujitsu, people tend to skip the hell out of it. And I've noticed it. It's like you mentioned earlier. I love doing my shadow work. I love doing my um, solo drills. I love doing my shots and my double legs and my sprawls and my sit outs. And I love doing my hip escapes and my technical stands and my front rolls and my back rolls. And I love doing hook sweeps and arm drags and guillotines. And I love doing all these moves in the air. It makes it so that you don't have to like rely on a person to do jujitsu with. Cause obviously I need someone to do jujitsu with, but not always. If you become good at the shadow grappling and practicing your moves in the air, then you don't never need a partner and you can, you can triple the amount of time that you do practice jujitsu in, um, and minimize the damage you take. Right? Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Think about it. Like you can get so much more done that way, but too many people get into this, like, well, I'm going to wait for somebody to come over and then I'll roll with them. Yeah. And then they don't even rehearse moves. They just jump right into to rolling. They jump right into number four. Yeah. They might practice moves for like a second. Like, oh, look at this arm bar I learned. Cool. What did you learn? Cool. All right. You ready to roll? Yeah, let's roll. <laughs> roll. Uh, I'm hurt. Why am I hurt? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like, you guys should have done 20 minutes of shadow wrestling first. And then 20 minutes rolling around on the ball like we did, which the ball for me, bag work in jujitsu is ball work. Of course. Instead of hitting totally a bag, good. we're moving around on the ball. You know what I'm saying? So 20 minutes of shadow. 20 minutes of ball and then 20 minutes of rehearsing moves. Now let's roll. I'm going to, I'm going to stop you there for just a second because that ball work is just in the two days that we've done it. Like it's the ball exercise ball. The big one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, stability the, yeah, balls. Thank you for that. That sounded totally gay when Ayo. I said that. Thank you. That's all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's unlocked my hips and my back. Like, like it's really helped. And you have, uh, that yoga ball work in one of your seminars, right? In the, on that Jeff Glover online. Is that correct? Um, most seminars that I do, and that's, I, I do two to three seminars a month on average. Yeah. Uh, most of them, I do a, a, a segment on the ball. 
Yeah. And I try to preach the ball to students. And, and so go out there and, and look at those seminars. But also, heck, you got the free stuff right on YouTube, too, with, with the ball work. Sure. And and it's it's a, so I just I wanted to stop you there because it's been it's been uh, very meaningful to me to kind of get that down. And I know I'm going to get better at it because I'm going to commit some time to it. But but go go ahead with that. Thought. Yeah, well, well, you're right. The, the ball. I mean, I could spend two hours talking about just, you know, stability ball training and how it will will make you better at jujitsu and make jujitsu less difficult and uh it, it turns you into a, a somebody who can flow somebody who can flow roll and when you can flow roll you can do way more jujitsu man you know what i'm saying these like these like aggressive rolls with people you can only do them for so long and so many times before your body is like ouch stop i don't want to fight anymore you can only fight so much, dude. Mm. You know mm. what I'm saying? Especially as like most people listening to this are probably a little older and getting older. You know, you don't you don't move backwards. You know, at 22 years old, you're a very different creature. You know, I used to get hurt really easy and the next day recover. <laughs> yeah, know? for sure. <laughs> so I'm trying to do as much jujitsu as I can as I get older. I just turned 40, had a back surgery and, uh, you know, my knees, I don't even want to know. It's, I don't even want to get MRIs and find out. Um, but I want to do as much jujitsu as I can without fucking sustaining all the injuries I did in my 20s. So I'm taking it mellow. I limit who I roll with. I do a lot of shadow work. I do a lot of shadow grappling. I do a lot of ball movement. I roll with the kids a lot. I roll with smaller people a lot. You know, I take it easy. I don't always turn the intensity up when I roll with people. Um... Yeah, but well, yep. even in tournaments, even in the matches I've seen, it doesn't look like a fight, man. It's like a, it's, it, 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 it looks like a you're having fun, and b the positions that you're in, you're creating those positions in a in a dynamic way. Yeah, that I guess that is strenuous, but but just uh, more flowy jujitsu than anything. Yeah, you know, and I, I've always been in really good shape. Even though I'm like a stoner and I'm known for smoking pot all day, I'm actually in amazing shape, especially in my early 20s. I worked out a lot. My coach made me do a lot of push-ups, sit-ups, squats, uphill sprints, up stadium sprints. I was an athlete. You know, you, you could even say I was like a professional athlete. I mean, yeah, sure. I was scrawny and skinny and I was like 140 pounds and there wasn't like any bulging muscles off my body. But I mean, I was a jujitsu cardio machine. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I just, I, I would rarely get tired. Yeah. And, and I don't want anyone to get the idea that I'm just like, you know, bendy, blah, blah, blah. I'm a badass athlete, bro. I'm a, I'm a muscular, I'm, I'm, I'm strong, I'm fit and I'm athletic. And that's a big part of why my jujitsu is what it is. I'm not just like, you know, wild and crazy. It's like, I'm also a, a, a disciplined professional athlete. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that something that, something that I really appreciate in your teaching style is you don't teach to your attributes; you teach to your students' attributes, right? Like just seeing what we've seen these past couple of days, it doesn't you teach it in a way that doesn't require the flexibility that you necessarily have, and I think that's really a, a, a commendable trait. To be able to do that and relate to those folks so i really appreciate that yeah well thank you I, I absolutely learned that from my coach you know and um thanks i think it's a skill that's helped me stay relevant in the teaching aspect of jujitsu for a long time yeah and yeah. will keep me relevant for a long longer time yeah agreed and now you're out in las vegas do you have a school that you you teach at like on a regular basis there I don't. I haven't. I haven't been a jujitsu coach since 2017. How much? What would your class have looked like when you did you run a program or did you just like teach alongside other people? Yeah. Um, like, yeah I was never really like in charge of anything. To be honest with you, okay. I've never owned anything. If you were going, because my question basically is like, if you were going to run a program. Ha, would you do the shadow stuff and the ball stuff with new people? Would you do that in like part of a fundamental beginner program sort of thing? Like how would that ideally work for you? Because I can think, I'm thinking from my perspective and how my brain works. If I walked in for the first day 
and I saw you bouncing on the ball, I'd be like, what is going on here? If I had no idea like what the movements were for. So I was just curious if you had yeah. done that. I mean, I can't live my life in fear of people thinking I'm weird. <laughs> Not that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm well aware of that, dude. I get that all the time. People come in, they, they see me do, I get comments on Instagram videos. They're like, see, that's why I don't tell people I do jujitsu because it's shit like this. <laughs> You know, they'll see me do Donkey Garden. They're like, that's not jujitsu. This guy's a joke. This guy's a clown. And I'm like, dude, you guys can think that all you want. I fuck up everybody I roll with. Every dude that's ever talked shit to me online and been like, oh, that doesn't look, that's not going to, that's, I would, you're bouncing on the ball. That's stupid. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm like, go somewhere else. Go train with the dudes that I fucked up. Everywhere you're going to go, you're trained with somebody that I beat up. Mm -hmm. That sucks compared to me. So go ahead and think the ball is weird and think it's crazy that I'm bouncing on the ball. Think donkey guard is stupid. Go ahead. Think all that shit you want. Then roll with me. I like that. Um, I like that donkey guard is even in a self-defense situation, defensively responsible. I think that's interesting that you're, you're staying away. You're keeping that distance yet closing that distance as well yeah a big part of donkey guard is is old school gracie style jiu-jitsu of do not get punched in the face ever right a lot of my jiu-jitsu people people are on this like oh i would just punch jeff no you wouldn't dog i've never been punched in my life <laughs> I've, I've never been in a fight where somebody managed to square a punch on me my jiu-jitsu friend the, the jiu-jitsu friend Gia taught me in the first six months of my time under him was was old school gracie style self-defense jiu-jitsu get motherfuckers into close guard get two underhooks lock hands raise those arms up and prevent the person from posturing up and punching you in the face and then climb to their back that's self-defense jiu-jitsu that's how you use the guard old school style and that's the shit that i'm first and foremost good at i'm a master of not getting punched in the face and those skills that Frangia taught me, it just led me to realizing like, dude, donkey guard is a version of not getting punched in the face. So, and it's something I used to do with my older brother. When my older brother would start fucking me up, I would turn around, <laughs> I would turn around and boom, back, back kick him in his dick or his stomach. You know what I'm saying? And that worked for years and I would never get punched. Right. But if I turned and faced him and tried to like dodge punches, I'm going to flip. Turn around, boom, kick him in his stomach and he's crying. Mom, Jeff, hit me in the stomach. And it's like, well, you were trying to sock me in the face, fool. So I remember back to my childhood. I was sure. like, well, that used to win for me. That was the one way I could fuck my brother up. I'm going to do that here in jujitsu. And people would get mm -hmm. mad at me. Mm -hmm. They were like, that's not jujitsu. Like Javi, I love Javi Vasquez, but he had a tournament, him and his, his ex-lady. They had a tournament and they banned donkey guard. What? They banned that's it. That's stupid. There was a rule, no donkey guard. And it was like, wow, really? He's like, that's not self-defense style jiu-jitsu. And I was like, all right, if you say so. I mean, he fought MMA, so I can't really argue against anything Javi says. You know, he fought in the UFC, so it's hard for me to argue against him. But I don't know. I've I've never lost a street fight, and I've been in several. Yeah. And I've always Did just you kind of explain to him what you were doing, keeping a distance with donkey guard and, and not being, you know, with your head down and not being able to be punched? Man, I'm, I'm, I wasn't trying to explain anything to anybody. I could give a shit less, to be honest with you. Yeah. I'm having fun, and you guys aren't. That's how I see it. Right. Right. Yeah, even um, even that that uh, deep arm drag, deep half, uh, e there's defensive responsibility from from strikes there as well. You know, in the in the method that you're teaching. So I, you know, not deep half, not necessarily known for being the most defensively responsible position, right? Well, you know, you got to understand. You need to be able to fight in situations where dudes are about to or have mount on you. Yeah. People transitioning into the mount, deep half guard's the way to deal with it, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we you guys already know the off-balancing principle, the initial off-balancing principle, and that's supposed to be your way to deal with them loading up a punch. You off-balance them. You can't punch somebody with power if you're off-balanced. Mm -hmm. They need to be stable and then fucking hit you. You know, but if you're constantly off-balancing and forcing the hands to the ground or forcing them to pull back, as you guys know, we, we studied ex intense that, those ideas absolutely um the results speak for themselves right no totally agree i mean it, it again you, you said it out there earlier too you know not getting punched from the closed guard it's such it's lost sometimes on today's jujitsu yeah. where they don't u utilize the legs the hips to be able to pull them and off balance them so there's no way they can get a, a proper strike on you from that position yeah 
Philly, you've talked a lot today. You, I mean, I have a shitty microphone. Well, so what? I did. I, I asked tons of things. You did not. Yeah. Come on, get in a uh, get in well, the conversation. I my question poorly, but I, thinking about it afterwards, I think you answered it the first time. So, like, if in your ideal jujitsu session, you would do twenty minutes of the shadow warm up and about twenty minutes of practice and stuff on the ball. I mean, those numbers can go in and out. They can go higher. They can go lower. But essentially, but yeah. like it, using it as like a long warm up for the sure. Fight. That was that was kind of. But yeah. you you would preferably always be doing something with the ball every time you're training. I mean, it depends. Yeah. Not not every time, you know. Like like Frangia, I, I was raised on forty five minute warm ups, bro. I was, Jesus Christ! I, I, I was raised on forty five minute calisthenics, forty five minutes of push ups. 40, and 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 squats and abs and jumping over people and going under legs and jumping over and going under the legs and climb the guy and go under the guy and sit up and grab sit up and grab and just these like warm ups warm ups boom and then get exhausted and half the class would bail. He'd be like, "All right, jujitsu time," and all these guys were like, oh, I can't breathe. "He's like, cool, you're too much of a little bitch to do jujitsu. Yeah. If you can't get through his forty five minute warm ups, you didn't deserve to do jujitsu. That's how he saw it." Man, you know and how good is that? Because the side effect of that is your sloppiest jujitsu is whenever you're tired. So that means your technique has got to take over during that. You see that how period. that happens? That's, That's how the smart alliance. that is. That's alliance jujitsu. That's alliance jujitsu. That's where Frangia, my coach, came from. That's what those guys did. They did half hour minimum. Half hour minimum warm ups. I, I remember when he started like letting me do classes, I would be like, fuck, do I gotta do those like crazy warm ups? All the push ups and sit ups and squats and shit? And I would do little 15 minute versions of it. You know what I'm saying? And he would always be like, it's a shit, bro. Like 15 minutes warm up. What's the shit? And I was like, well, I wanna get to the techniques and start rolling and shit. He's like, man, nobody sweat. Nobody's sweating, bro. You know? He would be like, what the fuck? No, no, no. 20 more minutes push ups. Everybody, 500 more. <laughs> I'm like fuck, right. <laughs> you know, that's, that's super smart, man. A lot of super warm-ups. smart. That, a lot of warm ups. Technique. That's I feel like you're saying that because you know you don't have to do 45 minutes of warm. No, but here's what I'm <laughs> here's what I'm thinking <laughs> is that like, look, I can do the ball work at home before I go to jujitsu, right? You know, we have 10 minute warm ups, right? That's generally what our warm up kind of is is a 10 minute warm up, not super strenuous. Anything it's kind of for the masses, but but exactly to be able to do that before that, that at least you know, even if I just do 10 20 minutes on the ball before, it's helping my mobility for sure, yeah. and definitely balance core work as well. Yeah. So, so adding that in, not saying to take that into the curriculum just mm-hmm. to, to do it on your own. I mean, yeah, I would do that. That wasn't part of French, that, that's something I would do like. I would show up like a half hour before class mm. and do that before his fucking 45 minute warm ups. <laughs> and then after class was done, he's like, all right, everybody, we're done. You can go home. I would get on the ball for an hour. Yeah. You know, and he was so loving, like he like, like me and Bill Cooper, when we were younger and we were training and like all the dudes that had jobs in school and shit would like done and go home. And me and Bill were like, dude, can, can we stay here and just like roll for like another hour? He would sit down and be like, go ahead, boys. His wife would call him. He'd be like, Brrr. Hey, honey. She'd be like, why aren't you home? He'd be like, oh, well, the, the boys the boys want to stay and roll. I'm going to stay here and let them. And she'd be like, da, 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 da. He'd be like, yeah, this is what I'm committed to. <laughs> you know? And then and then an hour later, he'd be like, you guys done? We'd be like, yeah, we're done. I'm like, all right, let's get out of here. He wasn't like, hey, guys, I got to get back to my fucking wife, dog. She's bitching at me. She's already told me I'm not getting pussy for two weeks because of this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He was like, hey, this is what you guys love. I, got, I, I have this building. Let's fucking do this. I'm here. I'll give you that extra hour of my time. He was very loving to us like that. That's incredible. It sounds yeah. like I know I know you have a father, but it sounds like he was almost a second father father yeah. figure to uh, you. Everyone has a dad, you know, but Frangie is, you know, Frangie is the like the man that I got to learn to emulate in my life because my real father's a pretty messed up person, and uh, he's not exactly the kind of person you want to emulate. And mm. he really didn't do anything with his life, you know, and he's just kind of blah, like blah. I'm just here. Never really like kept a job. Just, just a very poor. The poor guy. His, his, his life was fucked up, you know. So he didn't really like give me a role model to like, you know. He gave me somebody to not be like, you know. That's what I was saying earlier. Right. You got to learn what not to do. So yeah. with my father, I learned what not to do. With Frangia, I learned be a man, stand up straight, work out, be disciplined. You know, be noble, be honorable. You know, like if you make a commitment, you fucking you show up and you do it. 
You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you don't complain. And if you get hurt, you don't bitch about it. And just all this like extra overly like masculine, like machismo shit that he got from, from, you know, from his Brazilian, you know, uh, culture, you know, he's just overly manly, you know, yeah. and I was like, fuck, I had never seen that before. So he pushed that on me and, and, and literally molded me into a different person. Yeah, no, that's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, Jeff, we're going to wrap things up for the day, but just to, just to tell everybody out there how to how to find you, you're on at Jeff Glover BJJ on Instagram. That's how I hooked up with you. I just, yes, sir. Since you DM, you answered it immediately, and we set all this up. It was great. Then you've got also Jeff Glover online. That's some of your seminar stuff. Uh, obviously, you can go to BJJ Fanatics. You've got uh, plenty of instructionals there. The uh, uh, Dirty Darcing was a, a great one also. Um, they might be having a sale soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, BJJ Fanatics having a sale? You no know honor, bro. <laughs> Huge, Huge honor for me. That's right. Uh, and it, it, anything else that I missed as far as um, how to how to help support you or, or uh, find you on the interwebs, as it were? No, that's about it. Thank you. I appreciate that. JeffGloverOnline.com, Instagram. Uh, BJJ Fanatics videos hit me up I can do seminars and yeah that's about it man living a good life thank you for having me Jeff no man we we really appreciate it this you know I can't tell you how valuable it is just just the new stuff just no matter what level you're on to to be able to to learn from you so it's been a real honor for for me and I know the rest of the guys as well thank you woohoo and so if you're not out there, folks, doing something each and every day to get better, get out there and do it. Phil and I and Jeff Glover, we all choose jiu-jitsu. We hope you do, too. I'm about to feed them to the sharks right now. Get them hyped right now. Yeah. You know the ground is up. Yeah. Everybody that trains, you know the game. Yeah. So let's get it. Uh. Slap it up, bump it and roll. Hey. Yeah, that's the way that it go. Right. Ain't no better way to better yourself in this game. You're feeling the growth. That's, real. that's time on the mat. We put in the work. Believe it ain't easy, I know. You know. But we train for the love of the game, the love of the art. Now slap it up, bump it, let's roll. Let's roll.